Hi, welcome to another episode of Firm Returns Weekly. This week we've got a bit of a look back over the 2023 box global box office stats and uh, also some streaming ratings. So a couple of Warner Brothers Discovery media industry related ones. And also um, going to have a look a little bit at the financial services industry in the UK just to provide a little bit of a brief overview prior to the to the write up I'm doing on a, a company in that sector so I'll just share my screen oh. yeah and so as I said um Let's have a look first at the 2023 box office figures. So the estimated total global box office revenue for 2023 came to $33.9 billion, which is up 31% on 2022, but 15% below the average of 2017 to 2019, so the three years before the pandemic. Of this total, 9.05 billion dollars came from the US, a 21% gain on 2022, 7.71 billion dollars came from China, an 83% gain on 2022, which they when they were still very much locked down, and only 6% below the 2017-2019 average. So they've actually shown the biggest recovery to pre-pandemic levels. And then the remaining $17.1 billion came from all the other international markets, and this was a 20% gain on 2022. So Barbie was the top grossing film of the year with $1.44 billion in global revenue, followed by the Super Mario Brothers movie with $1.36 billion, Oppenheimer with $952 million, um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 with $845.6 million and Fast X with $704.8 million. So I think there were quite a few records broken from three of those five movies broke records, the top three. So Barbie was, I think, the highest, what was it, the highest performing film for Warner Brothers, so for that studio. Uh, it was also, I think, the highest grossing musical. I think they technically fits within the musical genre as well. Super Smash, uh, Super Mario Brothers was, um, I think, the highest grossing animated movie ever. I think that was the one it was. And Oppenheimer was the highest grossing documentary picture. So <laughs> there were three three films that all. Um, Great records there. Um, yeah, and I just, as I'm as I'm British, I'm just going to indulge a little bit and look at the UK box office figures. So the total ticket sales for the UK came to one point oh six billion pounds, which is equivalent to uh, one point three five billion dollars. This was up eight point three percent on twenty twenty two. So. It was the UK was largely open in twenty twenty two still, um, so it's not not such a stark difference there, but um, still significant. This is still significantly below the pre pandemic levels where revenue exceeded one point three billion pounds for each of the five years leading up to twenty nineteen. So yeah, we're massively below, um levels for even the five years the whole five years before um 2019 or before 2020 so uh yeah there's still a lot of recovery to happen in the uk there um yeah it's obviously taking us something but something that's quite interesting um is that the the top performing films in the uk uh were actually somewhat different to the the global top films. So Barbie still held the top spot with $122 million. Um, 
Oppenheimer beat the Super Mario Brothers. Uh, so those two sort of changed places. And we had um, Oppenheimer had $75 million and Super Mario Brothers movie did 70 uh, And then Wonka, which is just a movie that came out at the end of the year, um, has cut up at the close of the year, so 31st of December, had brought in uh, $62.8 million. So, uh, yeah, really phenomenal performance there. And actually, you, if for those of you uh, who've been following it closely, you'll know that Barbie and Wonka are both Warner Brothers movies. So it's been a, they've had pretty good showing um, in the UK. They've done pretty well with their UK releases, Warner Brothers Discovery have. Uh, the other thing is that the Wonka is still in theatres and it's still um, having a lot of screenings from what I can see. So there's pretty good chance that it might actually overtake Super, uh, Super the Super Mario Brothers movie. Um, it's, it's so yeah, it could could do another seven million um, in in the final few weeks or however long it runs for. It's not a great deal of competition right now, so I think it's still, it might still be taking the top spot each each week at the moment. Um, right. So the other thing to know is that when you look back at the global figures, um, three of the top five movies that I listed were actually a universal pictures movies so Oppenheimer was Universal Pictures um, Super, the Super Mario Brothers movie was as well um, and so was Fast X so three of the top five were Universal Pictures and then given this stat it might not surprise you that um, Universal Pictures actually took the top spot uh, as it, it was the studio that generated the most box office revenue out of any of the other studios and so in total it did they they released 24 films that generated a combined 4.91 billion dollars in revenue worldwide so this is the first time since 2015 which is uh i think the last year that universal pictures was in the top spot as was the first time since 2015 that any studio has been able to beat disney which generated uh, in 2023 $4.83 billion from its 17 releases. So, um, yeah, it could be a possible sign that the uh, the crown or, or it, uh, given the prevalence of Disney princesses in their IP, Tiara, um, it's starting to slip a little bit there. And, uh, yeah, I mean... I think it's. I mean, they they were pretty close. Those two top spots. There certainly wasn't a big, big margin between them. Um, yeah, just eight, eighty million dollars basically between the two. I think. Um, but yeah, Warner Brothers came in a respectable third place with three point eight four billion dollars, uh, and. I said here that it probably wasn't too bad considering, I mean, they obviously had the best performing film of the year with Barbie. Um, and they also obviously have had, uh, and, and in the UK, they actually had two of the top uh, four movies and maybe even the top three if, if we include the extended run of Wonka into 2024. Um but yeah, they've also released, I think, on my count, four superhero movies. So they did Shazam, Fury of the Gods, The Flash, Blue Beetle, and Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And pretty well, pretty well, all four of them flopped in the uh, cinemas. I thought Shazam, Fury of the Gods was a pretty good film. Um, the Flash had its moments, but there was sort of bad, bad CGI going on in there that sort of did ruin it a little bit for me. Blue Beetle was pretty good, but uh, nothing spectacular. And I haven't seen Aquaman Lost Kingdom, but it's not been 
not been very well reviewed from what I've seen. But uh, yeah, anyway, none of them really did much to garner interest from from audiences. Um, so yeah, they, I don't think any of those films did close to what they would have you'd have historically predicted for them. Like for instance, the first Aquaman film did over a billion on its own uh, in global box office revenue. So. Yeah, it's uh, and I don't think it. I think it might not even be the top performing out of the four. Probably, probably the Flash was the top performing out of the four, I guess. But there quite a lot of marketing went into that film that then, uh, unfortunately, um, didn't perform so well. But uh, yeah. So historically, these those films together could have generated at least another. You'd have potentially expect them to generate at least another billion dollars of revenue between them um but they obviously didn't uh, so that would have taken taken Warner Brothers comfortably into the uh, over the four billion dollar mark uh but you could say the same thing for for Disney this year which uh also didn't other than Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 which as we said did um came in fourth place with 845.6 million dollars so other than that uh film all of their other superhero hero movies did pretty poorly in the year as well so yeah um i think it's going to be quite a big change next year when i think both studios are only really doing one movie each i think so and they they're not real so um Disney's doing Deadpool 3, I believe, releasing that next year, and we're getting the second Joker film from, from DC. So, but that's quite dark, it's quite separate from a lot of the stand. It's not really a not really a superhero film. It's, it's sort of as with the first one, it's gonna be much darker and uh closer to real life, I guess. I don't think there's superheroes involved. Um yeah, so I think it's going to be a pretty quiet year for superhero-related movies next year, by comparison. And then in 2025, I think then that'll, that'll be the first year in which the the new slate of DC movies begins with um, with the uh, um, Superman Legacy film. That's when that's coming out. Yeah, but we've still got a good slate of films next year for Warner Bros. Discovery. Um, we've got June Part Two, which is supposed to have come out at the end in 2023. So that's another uh, that potentially would have been another one that would have boosted up the, the overall box office stats, but that's been pushed back till March next year, I think. Um, I think there's a Beetlejuice sequel coming out as well. This Furiosa, um, which is like a prequel to Mad Max Fury Road. Um, a new Godzilla and King Kong film. Yeah, that, I think there's uh, I can't remember. I, can't, there's another, I think there's another Lord of the Rings related one as well, and then there's obviously the Joker. As I said, um, yeah, there's a pretty pretty strong, pretty strong slate of movies outside of the, the comic book. Uh genre so uh, superhero genre so yeah should hopefully still be well i don't i think the ov- overall for all across all studios there's going to be a certainly a shrink in the number of a reduction in the number of films that come out i mean i think the the sort of glut of movies that we had in 2023 largely came from there being a lot of movies from that couldn't be released in 2022 because of disruption from the pandemic. And now we're going to have a similar thing in 2024 where the disruption of the actors and writers strikes has meant a lot of films have probably been dropped or delayed or what have you. Um, so yeah, but we'll, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll uh, keep this figure of $3.84 billion in mind. Warner Brothers next year and we can we can revisit back and we'll see as we go through the year 
add them up and see um see how they're doing relative to it. Obviously, Barbie uh, helped them out a fair bit uh, with this year, but you know, could if just a generally higher performance across the slate could achieve the same thing. Because you know, as long as they if they if they don't have any or a fewer number of flops, in the overall uh, performance of the studios in, in in aggregate might might be good. But uh, yeah, let's just sort of continue, just round it off with the last few studios. So Sony came in fourth place with two point oh nine billion dollars. Paramount get very close behind with um in fifth with 2.03 billion dollars and then um so just just to reference here we sort of see yeah there's it's kind of half the size in terms of the box office revenue a little a little more but um sort of half the size of the box office revenue of one of us there so just bearing that in mind when we're talking about potential mergers and things like that um and then lionsgate had a good year coming in sixth after breaking $1 billion in global box office revenue. And this is for the first time they've managed to do this, get over a billion dollars um, in the last five years. So its successes this year were John Wick, Chapter 4, The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, and uh, Saw 10. So I, I watched all three of these uh, films. And I gotta say I particularly enjoyed the the Hunger Games The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which is kind of like a an origin story of um President Snow, who's like the primary antagonist of the original films and in the original films played by Donald Sutherland. So um yeah, a really good character and to see it following the backstory and kind of like the creation of a villain is quite an interesting sort of plot to uh, to follow. Quite quite good. Um, and I think I saw something about them them actually Lionsgate spinning out their studios into a separate, yeah, you know, into spinning it out and 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 listing it separately. That could be, and then I think it would still be like eighty percent owned, or some eighty percent of the shares would be owned by the uh, Lionsgate sort of parent company. But uh, yeah, having like a separate thing, you could just have a stake in the studios, and there'd be like twenty percent of it in public hands. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. They've obviously had a pretty, pretty good year for the uh, for the studios here. So next, I just wanted to have a, a quick look at. Um, I just wanted to mention. Um, so there's a, I can't remember the, I think it might be Nielsen or something like that, collects together some sort of streaming TV ratings. Um, so US, basically the number of minutes of, uh, diff- content are viewed across all the different streaming platforms, uh, in the US. So uh netflix max paramount plus so on um and yeah with what was interesting into the looking back at the week commencing the 4th of december 2023 which is the latest week we now have the data for because it takes them a little bit i think they're like a month back looking back a month in time normally uh so for this week commencing the 4th of december 2023 uh, Young Sheldon became the most watched show on streaming platforms in the US. It clocked in 1.63 billion minutes of viewing across Netflix and Max, having recorded 1.85 billion minutes the week before and 963 million minutes in the week it premiered on Netflix, which was the 20th to the 26th of November. This shows you an example of how releasing a show on Netflix following a period of exclusivity on Max can help substantially increase its audience. Not only does this increase the revenue generated by the show, it also creates new fans that may be inclined to subscribe to Max in order to watch the next season. It's a very rational strategy, and the pursuit of this strategy I find uh, I find quite encouraging. So yeah. 
it's um i think there's quite a few examples now of shows that they they've been sort of using this strategy of having an initial exclusive release on max so anybody that's an immediate, already a fan of the show and will be subscribed to max to come and watch it but then there's also going to be people who wouldn't watch it unless it was on the platform they're already subscribed to so there's already 200 what 240 250 million i think um people on on netflix uh for number subscribers anyway i guess that some of them will be households and so on um well, a lot of them and then uh yeah you, you're basically just opening it up to that whole new audience and it allows shows that people probably if they'd just seen a trailer or something like that they maybe they wouldn't have been uh, enticed enough to subscribe to Max some of that, but it gives them a chance to see it. And obviously, they Max is uh, well, Warner Brothers Discovery is going to make money from it'll be they'll be get it licensing it out on a minutes viewed basis, so they'll be making plenty of money from these additional views that's getting on Netflix. Um, and a, a share of the uh, the ad revenue effectively or whatever. Or subscription revenue, um, and then so it's that's a way of sort of directly further monetizing the show, sort of beyond what it's already drawn as many as it's going to draw to max in that you know just in, just having it on there. But then if you then the effect of this as well is if you widen the audience, um, then that extends out, and you've got when the next season comes along of of a show, or whatever. Um, you've now got a, a much bigger fan base that are going to potentially, if you then release the next season exclusively on Max for the first few months or something, there's loads of people that maybe are going to come and give you direct payments. Um, and now they're fans. They don't want to wait until you, until it gets onto Netflix. They'll, uh, they'll go in, over to Max and subscribe there first. Uh, and then maybe find all the other good content there. So yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a, a good, strategy and I'm, I'm liking the fact that they're doing it they're not just trying to do the flawed strategy which was happening before the um the acquisition that like going back to the days of uh what was it the uh when they were doing straight to streaming movies and stuff like that which i think was one of the actually ended up alienating Christopher nolan who was a big uh, money maker for for Warner Brothers discovery before that and uh, you know, they would have had probably would have had Oppenheimer in the One Brothers Discovery stable. They might have had two of the top uh, movies of the year if uh, if it hadn't been for that falling out there. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I'm going to keep an eye on these TV racings going forward. Obviously, a lot of it is um, all the top shows on netflix but having said that there are there's still some really dependable shows like the big the the actual original the big bang theory and friends are both really major shows that are, i think are just exclusively on max in the u.s and still draw in high high hundreds of millions each week in in viewing minutes so yeah still really really got some great ip in there that that does keep people engaged and, and draw people in so i just wanted to make one quick little note on aviva uh, to say that they completed their acquisition of optium as discussed back in december so um back in december i said um on monday the 27th of november Aviva announced the acquisition of Optium O2 Holdings Inc., a leading provider of vehicle replacement insurance in Canada, for total consideration of circa £100 million or circa £170 million Canadian dollars. This should bolster Aviva's existing uh, Canadian operations and move them closer to their goal of being the top insurer in Canada. As a capital light business, the acquisition also aligns with the growth strategy of the wider group. So yeah, uh, they said it was going to complete early next year, and it now has done so. So yeah, quick, pretty quick turnaround on that acquisition, which is great. Um, 
no big regulatory headaches. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, so I'm I'm currently working on a write-up for DSW Capital, which is a firm, it's a firm that works on our licensing model. So it's a little bit sort of above the lower level um, operations, but it, but the the licensees of the business are all working in the financial services industry, um, largely in sort of corporate finance and financial due diligence, uh, which are both sort of service lines related to merger and acquisition activity. And I'll go into all of this um, one in the right and so on. But this sort of origins of before DSW Capital was created, it was a there was originally a DSW. Uh, which stands for Dow Schofield Watt. Um, corporate finance uh, was was the original business. It was a financial boutique focused on corporate finance, as the name suggests. Um, and that so that because of that, they naturally they when they started then sort of effectively licensing out their brand to other um, names and created the DSW Capital. A company uh, naturally they're going to draw people that they know in similar industry in in, in similar businesses uh, within their their sort of sector um providing some similar services and yeah they drew them in uh people that are part of their network and so on so yeah it's kind of meant that currently the business is gets more than half, yeah, the majority of its menu of its um of its revenue more i think it's something like 60 to 70 percent uh, as of last the last full year's results were from merger and acquisition sort of related activities or split between the corporate finance and financial due diligence stuff but um yeah i'll go into all of this in the write-up again but they are they are sort of since diversified a bit with some more uh, business recovery lines uh in there and a few other things so um it's not quite as not quite as heavily weighted into it as it as it has been historically but but anyway they the current slowdown in m a activity which we've seen over the last year or so um has has had an impact on dsw as you'd expect because uh they are so heavily weighted towards the activity within this sector um and they're they're also in the sort of mid size small to mid sort of size transaction space i think their average transaction size is something like 25 million so on the on the smaller end but uh the range the transactions can range from much lower than that to um to you know a, a fair bit higher but that's that's just the average but um, yeah, that basically means that maybe some of the headline M and A activity you see with the, between the bigger players and so on might be sort of not quite at the level that you that this that DSW uh, capital is sort of operating within, which is going to be more your your SMEs and and so on getting getting bought out, uh, acquiring each other. <laughs> Or private equity coming in and picking them up and so on, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, like, so this is actually, this is why there's potentially an interesting opportunity here from an investment standpoint is that while it has had an impact, it hasn't been you know, crazy and, and things also seem to be turning. We may have potentially reached a turning point. But uh, the, the share price has seen a very substantial drop. So it's seen them greater than 50% drop over the last year. So that's put it into a quite an attractive level in terms of, uh, yeah, earnings, earnings yield, dividend yield as well. So, uh, it, it's kind of, it, it, but we will, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to look more into it when we go into go through the deep dive and so on, but we should hopefully be, within uh, by the end of the month but yeah it has created it's probably gone further than the actual underlying businesses 
the fall in the share price has probably been greater than the fall in the underlying business performance. But yeah, what I wanted to sort of talk about a little bit today was the in, interesting article I read talking about sort of deal flow and and um, cost cutting that's going on across the the broader sort of UK financial services uh, industry and what maybe some of this is some of the actions being taken what what they what they indicate so principally yeah they are cutting back on staffing costs and this is because there has just been a real slowdown on uh, slowdown in, in in deal flow uh, there's not as many acquisitions happening or, or mergers or other deals um and this extends also into like the property space as well commercial property etc seen a big big slowdown um and so you know a lot of these firms involved this this is going to include sort of law firms working in this sector uh the big the big accounting consulting firms etc um have, have been cutting back on their staffing costs but what's sort of been quite interesting is that um instead of just doing a cutting back and and the cutbacks are literally just laying people off. There ha- there has been some of that, but quite a lot as well has been getting people offering people the opportunity to take reduced hours. So they take do a four day working week, for instance, instead of five, um, in order to save costs and also allow people to sort of keep their jobs and what have you. And it helps to keep um, the reason this is has historically been a good move to do do this kind of thing is that the financial services sector has generally been one of the the fastest to recover from economic downturns so the fact that they are taking this kind of action means that they're anticipating um an imminent upswing in activity and they don't want to have lost all the staff that then would then be capturing that upswing so uh yeah they're trying to retain as many personnel as they can while also cutting back on the cost and just trying to keep that cost base down. But we've DSW Capital has done similar things as well. Um well, sorry, they don't it's not quite they haven't there has been a that they don't really control the staffing of their licensees. There have been cuts there. You can definitely see the number of um fee earners that's has fallen. But what they have been doing is actually sort of counter psychically. They've been investing quite a lot in trying to recruit new partners. So if you've got people in these sort of firms that are the big four accounting firms or et cetera or whatever that are there and they're being told, oh, we're cutting back, uh, we're not going to give people bonuses this year or, um, no, you know, we're not making anybody partner this year or, you know, or cutting back on the number of people who make partners this year or, or whatever they feel that there's not an opportunity for progression, or they're even being offered reduced hours or whatever, which is they don't want to take up. So the kind of time where they, those are, create those kind of push factors that help to motivate people to go and maybe think, oh, maybe I could start my own uh, consultancy here or whatever, and or start my own partnership. And then DSW has quite a strong offering. For, to, for people who want to do start their own partnership to, to become part of their their network and benefit from their brand and um and sort of weight that carries and, and then do all the back office support and whatever that just means they can with you it, it takes a lot of the the pain out of trying to start a, your own business and and the provision of startup capital etc which all forms part of the recruitment efforts that they're at the investment in recruitment there and they've actually taken the uh, number of partners up to i think the last reported figure was 51 partners and i think it had been something like 40 40 or 42 uh a year before or something so yeah it's really quite substantial growth and um effectively the partners then when when we do get an upswing again in the market the 
the partners are then the ones effectively each one is an entrepreneur sometimes there'll be two or three different partners in the same business but um they will then be hiring additional staff and that increases you that's why the number of fee earners is is about i think 104 or something was the last count so that's where you get to your 104 your 105 whatever is that they're all going to then have additional staff that they bring on that aren't partner part of the partnership but are just brought on as employees um, but are still doing participating in the deals and can and recording billable hours etc so you increase the number of partners you then effectively it's like increasing the number of business licensees in your network um which then means that that's then the potential for organic growth that then they can individually as they try and grow their own businesses by hiring new people you increase the number of fee earners you get your uh, and you increase the license fees that come in so yeah it's um it's been it's been quite positive um to see them taking that sort of counter cyclical move and they have they've been around since uh 2002 orig- you know the, the original not dsw capital but the original dsw corporate finance um has been around since 2002 so yeah they've they've been through a few downturns you could you could say especially with 2008 being in there and so on uh and they obviously had a a career before that uh having i think they all came from kpmg the original partners so yeah that but they in their time in their business they've always tried to make that contrarian take that contrarian approach of investing in recruitment in the times when the rest of the market's sort of retrenching and that's proven to be a pretty good move that's helped them to really accelerate their growth they uh when then the market recovers uh so yeah and and we're starting to see some early signs from the final few months of 2023 that things maybe have bottomed and they are starting to come back but uh that sort of management was cautiously optimistic um so yeah we'll have to see how things pan out but but anyway that will be something to keep an eye out for in your inbox or youtube feed or podcast feed or whatever uh when that comes out and hopefully again it'll be by the end of this month so i'm actually away for quite a bit of the first few weeks first half of february let's say so yeah it will uh i definitely want to get this out before then so yeah i will uh wrap it up there please like subscribe share all that that good stuff uh yeah and, and go across if you haven't gone across and subscribed to the newsletter yet please do that as well that that would be great um great to have as many people on board there as possible and yeah and you get all these this this access to this article will come into your as you can see i did this on published this on the 6th of january so this would have come into your your inbox and you could have um you'd have been able to see it and some it's often a day or two later that i, I do the video so you get there get this out a little bit earlier but anyway i will call it a day there so thank you everyone for watching and i will see you all in uh, the next episode